So we have with us uh, Hugo Bruzzo, who is uh, physically in Brazil now. He's in uh, Paraíba, in João Pessoa. Uh, Hugo is from, uh, uh, from Sisa in Italy, in Trieste. And he will give a, a, a mini course, uh, one of the four uh, mini courses. So it's a three lecture mini course on the uh, Mackay correspondence in three dimension between geometry and physics. Please, uh, Hugo. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it very much this invitation. I'm very happy to participate in this school. And I see it is a very well attended school. Uh, a lot of uh, participants. And so the idea is to tell you something about uh, um, the following fact uh, that uh, if you consider, uh, now I'm, I'm, I start with some hand waving, okay, then uh, I will uh, start with preliminar, preliminaries and def definitions, whatever. But so, um, uh, the idea is the following, that you have a finite group acting uh, on a vector space, uh, complex vector space. Uh, so uh, this is uh, acting linearly. So um, the quotient, uh, uh, if you want to consider, we have a singular point. And then you want to resolve the singularities. So you want to uh, get a new space, uh, which in some sense uh, sits above uh, the singular quotient. It's called the resolution of singularities. And the McKay correspondence, it's, it's, a, and it's, a, it's a smooth space, okay? It's sitting in some sense, the minimal smooth space is sitting above uh, the, the singular quotient. And the McKay correspondence basically means that uh, just knowing the group and its action on the, on the linear space, uh, you know uh, uh, a lot about the geometry of the resolution. In particular, uh, technically, you know the cohomology with uh, uh, coefficients in the field. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so I will start with some preliminaries about uh, um, the algebra geometry, basic algebra geometry that one needs to study these problems. Uh, then I will switch to uh, studying the resolutions of singularities and uh, stating uh, uh, the McKay correspondence in two dimensions, and, uh, and then I will go to three dimensions. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, I will um, hint to some physical applications. So the idea is that my lectures will be mainly mathematical, and uh, in the third lecture, uh, I will uh, show that actually everything we uh, we, we are going to see in the first two lectures uh, has a precise counterpart uh, in, uh, uh, in supersymmetric field theory. So the physical applications uh, I was mentioning are in quantum field theory, in particular uh, uh, to supersymmetric field theory. So there's really a very precise dictionary uh, where uh, anything that you need in mathematics to study this problem has a very precise uh, counterpart in the physical theory. And as usual, this may be used either to apply mathematics to understand the physical problem or to use the physics uh, to, uh, to shed light uh, uh, and, and get ideas uh, about uh, the mathematics uh, of the problem. Okay. So, uh, so um, we shall be considering, now I'll, I'll be back to this again, of course, but uh, we shall be considering uh, quotients uh, of, the, of the kind uh, Cn modulo G, where G will be uh, a finite group uh, sitting inside, uh, typically the special uh, linear group uh, of order N. Okay, so G is going to be finite. And, uh, and this is going to be an example of what is called an affine variety. So I will start by talking a little bit uh, about affine varieties. So you, you, you see by trade, I am an algebraic geometer with applications to, to string theory and quantum field theory. So 
uh, I assume that uh, this is not exactly uh, the, the, the central topic uh, of the school. And I will assume that uh, uh, perhaps people will need uh, some basic introduction to, to the techniques uh, uh, I'm going to use. So the idea is the following. Ah, uh, sorry, from the point of view of notation, uh, the, uh, um, we are going to use, I mean, the so-called ground or base field is going to be the complex numbers, but out of custom, probably very often I will call it K, okay? So uh, as a matter of fact, everything I'm going to say today is going to apply also when K is any field, uh, uh, perhaps just uh, algebraically closed. But we may think it is the complex numbers, no, no harm in that. Uh, and uh, uh, I will denote by AN uh, the, the vector space KN, okay? actually thought of as an affine space uh, rather than uh, a vector space. Then an affine variety uh, inside some uh, uh, affine space AN is something uh, which is cut by a number uh, of uh, polynomial equations, a number of polynomials. So we have a number of polynomials in n variables. Say R of them. And we consider the, 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 the space, uh, right, uh, cut uh, in, in, in a fine space by these polynomials. Um, uh, so these are polynomials, as I was saying, in uh, n variables. So I can write they belong to the ring of polynomials in n variables uh, with the coefficients uh, in, in the field k. Uh, so this, of course, is a ring. It's even an algebra over uh, the field k. And, uh, and the polynomials uh, will generate, uh, right, the polynomials will generate uh, an ideal E, I, sorry, inside this uh, polynomial uh, ring. Simply I is the set of linear combinations uh, G, I, F, I, where G, I is any polynomial. And that being an ideal uh, that uh, perhaps we shall even call uh, I of X, right? Um, we can take the quotient uh, of the uh, um, polynomial ring by it. And of course, we obtain a ring, which again is actually, uh, to be more precise, a, a K algebra. And this is called the, it is a name. It, it's called the coordinate ring. Of our uh, fine variety. Why I'm talking about this, we shall see in a moment. I mean, this is important to give, uh, it's a way that we are going to use to give the quotient uh, CN mod G uh, some uh, structure, uh, some uh, structure of the writing. Uh, no, wrong. Oh, anyway. Uh, so, um, so this actually establishes a correspondence with uh, which uh, if we want to talk very formally is an equivalence of categories between uh, uh, the affine varieties
and uh, uh, what we get by uh, taking the coordinate rings. And these, uh, the name of these things uh, is the following. Uh, these algebras are finitely generated because they are a quotient of the um, polynomial algebra, which has n generators, you know, the variables. So the quotient is a fortiori finitely generated and uh, uh, they have known importance. Okay, in the polynomial ring, uh, there are non importance uh, and the same happens uh, in its quotients by an ideal. So the, the, the objects we are considering are finitely generated. Uh, to have non importance uh, is called to be reduced. So we are talking about these two uh, class of objects, or we could say categories. And uh, the idea is that uh, they are equivalent. That they, in particular, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And uh, the, the arrow going, let's say, to the left, uh, for my speaking uh, uh, factor, uh, is called, the, this operation is called to take the spectrum. So this operation is called spec. Okay. Uh, so in particular, if we start from such an algebra, uh, we can even say what its spectrum is. Uh, Ugo, I think there is a question from Dimitri. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can you uh, remind finitely generated? So what are the generators of the algebra in this case? Are you're not talking about polynomials or... or you... in, the, in the polynomial ring, you can, or algebra, you can think the generators are the variables. And in there, there's, you consider just a finite number? Oh, okay. So, okay. Yes, so this... N, and in the quotient, the images, the images in the quotient, uh, no, no, it's, it's not true, but the, all quotients are finitely generated. Okay, not the generator, uh, maybe probably more, yes, but the all quotients are finitely generated. So they are going to be a bunch of polynomials. Okay. Uh, No, yeah, sure. The, uh, yeah, technically the exits, the, the classes of X uh, the variables themselves, yeah, they may be the card as the generators. Um, okay, uh, so the spectrum, uh, the, so mm, the points actually of the spectrum are the so-called maximal ideals. This is not particularly important, just mentioning it uh, uh, for completeness. Um, uh, you, um, you can consider, uh, you may think that the points of the spectrum are the maximal ideals of uh, the algebra you are considering. Uh, um, and they come with a um, particular topology, which is called the Zaliski topology. This uh, simply means uh, that the closed set in this topology are the zero loci of polynomials, of uh, collections of polynomials. Uh, collections of polynomials. Okay, this, this, so it's a, it's a topology which is specified by telling what are the closed subsets. Uh, and these are the zero loci of, uh, of bunches of, of polynomials. So why um, we are uh, doing this? Uh, now we go to uh, the, the fact that uh, we can give our uh, in quotients, uh, a structure of a fine variety in the following way. Actually, we assume the group, as I was saying, uh, uh, G to be finite, or actually, for what I'm going to say for some little time, uh, it could be more general, it could be a reductive group uh, over the complex numbers which means that it is uh, 
the complex form they in the case, in the complex case the notion of reductive group means that it is the complex form of a compact real group So, so finite group is a, is a special case of reductive actually. And you assume that G acts linearly. On uh, CN for some N. And then it also acts on the polynomials. Now I will remember that uh, we are considering uh, complex numbers, right? Simply, you have a polynomial act acting uh, on uh, n variables. You act on the variables uh, with uh, your group, which acts uh, on, on CN. And um, uh, and then uh, uh, you can consider. To inside the, uh, the polynomial ring, you can consider the subring of polynomials that are invariant under a dissection. Okay, so this is uh, the invariant subring. It is definitely reduced it has non impotence because it is inside a ring which has non impotence. It's also finitely generated. This is by far less trivial, but it is true. It's a theorem due to Hilbert. So this is reduced and finitely generated. And then we can define as, a, as an affine variety, we can define our quotient as the spectrum of the invariant subring. This is a special case of the algebraic geometric uh, construction, which is called the geometric invariant theory. Okay, we may think that uh, as a set, uh, it's uh, what we would think uh, uh, of the quotient, uh, namely the set of orbits, uh, but it's given in a fine variety structure uh, with this uh, um, in this way. Now the point is that uh, uh, G acts linearly, so of course uh, uh, zero or the image of zero to be more precise is, uh, is a singular point. Right, because it comes from a fixed point. We expect this at the least. In general, uh, for um, we are for the moment considering any possible value of n, uh, there may be more uh, singular points, uh, and uh, and we shall see uh, it this uh, later on. So let me just give you uh, a, a simple example. We may consider the case n equal to uh, and for group, we consider the group Z2. Uh, Ugo, the, uh, maybe before we go into the example, there is another question from uh, uh, Sasha. Yes. Uh, so, sorry, very, very quick question. So uh, you, you really require invariance of the polynomial, not just zeros. 
right? I mean, so the polynomial should be invariant uh, as it is, not up to like uh, multiplying yeah. by a number, so zero the somewhere. Yeah, yeah, the subring of invariant polynomials, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. uh, your question is um, uh, right, because uh, it would, it is a relevant question in the case we consider portions, uh, say, polynomial over the projective space for which right, we, right. Mm -hmm. they must be homogeneous in so, such a way that at least you can talk about their zero loss I, mm -hmm. uh, not really their value, right? But uh, no, in this case, just, just uh, thanks. And indeed, the example will show this thanks. because uh, the, the, the action clearly I have also to specify an action, and the action is uh, uh, of the, gener the generator of Z2 is uh, um, just the change of sign. Okay. Uh, and then uh, C, X1, X2, Z2 um, can be shown that uh, is generated by uh, X, X1 square, X1, X2, and X2 square. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, the fine variety C mod Z2 is exactly the spectrum of, uh, of this polynomial ring. This is a funny way of writing it in a way because it's not really this, uh, but we should do the following uh, and I will explain now. Uh, if we give names uh, to these three objects, uh, so we call it U, X1 square, V, X1, X2, and T, X2 square, then we see that uh, uh, this satisfies the relation that UT equals V square, right? And so to be more precise, uh, this uh, is uh, the quotient of uh, uh, the polynomial ring in the variable UTV by the ideal generated by UT minus V squared. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the ideal, in this case, the ideal generated by one polynomial. Uh, and the polynomial expresses the equation of the locus we are considering. So we are expressing our quotient as a, as a surface inside the C3. And the surface is the surface which has this equation. Okay, it's a cone. Okay, it's what is called in a fine cone which of course is singular in the vertex, which is the origin in, in these coordinates. Okay, so uh, this is an example. Uh, and I stress that uh, in this case, uh, our um, singular quotient is uh, an affine variety inside the C3. And actually, uh, now I can switch to something that I already prepared. Uh, there's a, a, a full classification of uh, the possible situations uh, in, in, uh, in uh, dimension two. Okay. And uh, uh, in dimension two, uh, the, I mean, this slide already refers to the McKay correspondence in dimension two, so we shall be back to, to this slide later on. Uh, the idea is that uh, you have uh, several possibilities. For instance, the first uh, case here called AN is uh, uh, in, the, in this case, the group uh, is the group ZN. So it generalizes what we saw in the example, uh, not ZN, uh, should call it ZK, okay? 
uh, acting, uh, no, sorry, Zn because uh, the slide says N, but this is not the N of Cn. We are, now we are considering C2, right? And uh, so for, for N equal to, we get the previous example. And here, the three coordinates are not called UVT, they are called XYW. But you see that uh, the singularities are uh, described as the surfaces in C3. The first equation is not exactly what I wrote, but it, it can be reduced or to, to transformed into the other, uh, in the form I gave by a simple uh, change of coordinates. The second line corresponds to groups uh, that are called themselves DN. They are the dihedral groups. And then we have the exceptional groups. I'll, I'll be back to this later because this uh, slide also shows very important facts about uh, the McKay correspondence uh, in uh, the two dimensions. Um, okay. Um, good. So we have uh, also example, one example and perhaps more examples, even uh, if less explicit, explicit and um, now I would like uh, to again to develop uh, a little piece uh, of theory um, because uh, uh, we want uh, we shall need to to consider what is called the canonical bundle uh, or sheaf, actually, generally speaking, but it will be a bundle in our case. Even. Um, we shall assume from this moment, as it was also the case uh, in the, in the two-dimensional two examples I showed, uh, that G uh, is, uh, uh, acts as a subgroup of SLN rather than GLN, okay, SLNC. And then, uh, technically, uh, this implies, uh, uh, in, to start with, uh, the fact that uh, the quotient uh, is, is normal. Normal, I don't want to tell you what a normal means, uh, but in particular, it means that singularities uh, are in co-dimension at least two. Okay, so for instance, uh, when N is two, when we have a quotient of C2, we just have the origin. Because uh, they must be point, uh, since the action is linear, it must be the origin. In dimension three, we may have uh, uh, lines of singularities, but not singular surfaces, um, not surfaces of singularities. Okay, so they are in dimension two. And uh, uh, now well, we start calling X zero, actually the quotient, Uh, so, uh, singularities are in the, they are a closed subset of co dimension at least two. So, this means that this is a regular, which is a, a word that algebraic geometers prefer to, to smooth because smooth uh, it, it has another meaning. Uh, um, the, regu the, the regular smooth points made up, make up. Uh, in open, uh, that dense actually, subset. Let me call it U. So in, uh, in, the, in, in the open subset, I can consider differential forms. U, U not U zero, sorry. Okay, so omega K U, will be actually the sheaf of the bundle of uh, um, differential K, uh, of, uh, sorry, of K forms. We may think of holomorphic K forms, okay? Perhaps they should be rather algebraic, but 
okay, let's not go for details. details. Uh, um, we are thinking of holomorphic uh, K forms. And now, and in particular, uh, if I consider if the dimension of X zero, sorry, the dimension of zero is n, of course, because we're taking quotient by uh, a finite group. Uh, the top forms, as we know, are a line bundle, which is called a canonical bundle. of U. Then I consider the inclusion of U into X zero. And technically, now I explain what it is. Technically, I will consider the direct image of these sheaves of K forms. I'll be back in a moment to, to what it means. And this, we then now I just introduce the notation. This shift is called the, the is the shift of Zariski K forms. What is this shift? It's defined in the following way. Uh, as all sheaves uh, or bundles, this is not really a bundle, but almost, I have to say what it is uh, on every open set. Uh, and I say that this is the sheaf I started from uh, on the intersection between V and U. So we are in this situation. I will make a drawing. This, this is U, this is not a whole space X zero. So there are points, and, and it's open, okay? It's open, doesn't include the, the boundary. Uh, actually X zero is the closure of it because U uh, is, is dense. So you have points uh, which lie on the boundary. It's a little improper, but I will anyway denote in this way an open subset V, and uh, the forms we consider are the forms on this intersection. And this defines uh, these uh, um, sheaves. Uh, so it's a way to be able to talk about uh, reasonably well behaved uh, forms uh, on a singular space. These are called Zariski K forms. Uh, and again, and again, when we consider we we consider the, the top uh, degree, which is n, we denote this as omega, small omega x zero, and we call it the canonical shift. It's the definition. of X zero. And then we have a theorem which says that when, as we are assuming, G X as a subgroup of SLMC, omega X zero is a line bundle. This actually is in, 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 geometry, in algebraic geometry as a technical uh, terminology and deserves uh, some special terminology. One says that uh, um, X zero is Gorenstein. It's a some form of control on the singularity. The singularity is not so bad because at the end of the day, at least uh, the canonical shift is a bundle. It's nothing more exotic than, than a line bundle. Rank one 
and a line a vector a line bound on it. So it's a it tells that the singularity is is, is kind of mild. Why I, I need uh, this notion? Because uh, we want to consider a special class of resolutions. Uh, perhaps I could stop here and ask if there are any questions so far. Are there questions maybe from the students? No, I have just a, a small question, Hugo. Uh, if uh, X zero, can you re remind me what is X zero? X zero is the smooth part, right, of the quotient? No, X zero is the quotient. Ah, is the quotient, so it's yeah. not necessarily smooth. Okay. I told you the, the, the smooth part. Okay. Ah, okay, yeah. And then you, can, can, can I? Because on the smooth part, you know what differential forms are. Yes. And then you okay. use this picture to have decent differential forms on the whole space. And okay. this is not because uh, the singular locus has a codimension at least two, okay? Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work that well. But uh, in our case, uh, uh, the fact that the G is inside SLN implies that. Okay. Not uh, okay. Uh, there is Sasha also who has uh -huh. a question. Just a very quick question. That theorem does not uh, say anything, that line bundle. Is it trivial, non-trivial? Well, actually, um, um, no. No, okay. It's not trivial. Uh, non-trivial. Non it's not trivial and we, we shall have a way of checking that. Okay. Uh, in, in a way. Um, basically, what you do is to take the trivial chief and you take uh, its, uh, its invariant sections under the action of the group. And, the, and this is mm -hmm. not. Um, so. Well, um, I'm not sorry. In the case where the group is SLNC, uh, it's trivial, sorry. Because okay. of the group is SLNC, sorry. Mm -hmm. When G acts inside the SLNC, it is trivial. And we shall, uh, I modify my sentence, and we shall have a way to check it, actually. But when we are inside the SLNC, it is trivial. Okay, sorry for the... Uh, so, as I assume, singularity is going to be another variety. With a morphism to our singular quotient. With some properties. The first property is that X is, is a smooth. The second is that the projection is proper, which in algebraic geometry means much more than uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, topo that same uh, notion in topology, but um, let's not be um, uh, fuzzy uh, and uh, fussy, sorry. And uh, um, let's say that uh, it's a generalization of the notion of properness in topology, and we want it to be birational. Birational means that it, it is an isomorphism away from a closed subset. So if we remove from X a suitable closed subset, it becomes an isomorphism. Actually, what will happen is that uh, if we remove the inverse image of the singular locus of X zero, it will become an isomorphism. So where there is nothing to do because X zero is already smooth, we do nothing. Uh, where X zero happens to be singular, 
we replace the singularities with something. And uh, X, one should specify, and we shall see this in examples, that X is no longer a fine, but rather it's covered by a fine varieties. It's something that it's obtained by patching a fine varieties. And of course, it has its own canonical sheaf, which is a line bundle even more than that of X zero because X is smooth. And then we have a definition. We say that uh, we may think that we are talking about a pair. X pi is a crepant resolution If the canonical bundle upstairs of X is the pullback of the canonical bundle of X zero. This is not uh, uh, what always happens because uh, in general, uh, you, uh, it's not true. Uh, so in, in general, so when the resolution is not crepant, uh, omega x, uh, there is no way that it's done like this. Uh, it is uh, this uh, tensor, some other line bundle. Uh, so why crepant? Crepant is um, a terminology invented by Miles Reed it, it meaning that it's not discrepant. So crepant is discrepant minus this. And uh, uh, as far as I know, the word doesn't exist in English. Uh, and, uh, so it's just uh, right, an invention by Miles Reed. Uh, in, again, meaning that it's not discrepant. And even in English, probably, uh, I don't know because I'm not a native speaker, but might be that it sounds a little uh, funny because uh, you see, I, I took the, 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 what it means from Latin, the, the, ver the, the verb crepare, uh, and it means, uh, well, of course, to some in English uh, here of somebody who, who knows some Latin, it's like a creaking resolution. Uh, probably something like that. In Italian, it's even funnier because uh, the main meaning is the same as in Latin. Crepare means to crack, but uh, slang in slang means to die. So it's uh, the Italian equivalent of kicked bucket. Okay, so uh, uh, no, it's uh, a dying resolution, which has nothing to do with the truth. I mean, because the resolution is, they are very nice, very good, uh, well and alive. Uh, anyway, this is the story of the terminology. And uh, uh, now probably I have still 15 minutes. So perhaps I will add something uh, and then we shall go for examples. We add something here. Because of course now uh, we have, uh, first of all, a problem about uh, existence and uniqueness. So we may ask, uh, so we have a question, which is the following, do crepant resolutions exist? and if they are unique, if they exist. Ah, by the way, um, I should mention why, for instance, this is relevant because we said that in our case, when the group is inside SLN, 
uh, the canonical sheaf is trivial. Therefore, if the resolution is discrepant, uh, the pullback over the trivial sheaf is trivial. So we have a variety with a trivial canonical sheaf. This is called Calabi Yau variety. And these varieties are of the utmost importance, for instance, uh, in string theory. Because uh, when you compactify, we shall have a look at this later on. When you compactify string theory on some uh, um, in internal space, uh, the physical uh, properties of the theory force uh, this compactification space to be Calabi-Yau. It's basically the, the absence of some quantum anomalies, right? So, uh, so calabi yaus are a very important class of variety, right? So by looking for Crepan resolution of our quotient varieties, we are looking for non-compact clear uh, calabi -Yau varieties. So the, uh, the answer to this question is, as always, it depends. For n equal to, they exist, always exist, and are unique. Unique and are unique. For n equal three, they always exist, but maybe not unique. For n bigger than three, they may not exist. Okay. So, um, okay, uh, stra very strangely, I'm uh, uh, respecting my schedule. Uh, and I, I would like to say a few words uh, about toric geometry. Because, uh, why? Let me motivate this fact because uh, uh, in the abelian case, when G is abelian, um, the resolutions may be constructed using toric geometry. And, uh, and actually the Tori geometry is important even in an abelian case to study the problem. But uh, as it's written here, this sentence is true only uh, in, the, in the abelian case. Uh, so the idea is the following. In general, in any dimension, uh, we should consider now what is called a lattice, but uh, we may consider the lattice to be the standard one. So we consider, right, the group Zn as sitting inside Rn. The points of Zn, we call them rational, okay? They, they are going to be the rational points of Rn. And then we consider a convex polyhedral cone. Actually, we want it to be strongly convex. It means that if we intersect it with its minus, we are inside our range, so it makes sense. You only get the origin. And then, uh, so this Zn would be our, a lattice, 
but with the choice of uh, bases in the lattice, in the only thing it is Zn, M would be the dual lattice. But again, we may identify it with Zn. And then from sigma, we construct another, we construct a cone in the dual space. So we construct a dual cone, which we call sigma v. These are all elements Um, I will call them small m. No, I will call them u in the dual Rn such that the action is non negative on all elements of the cone. For instance, uh, if I have uh, a cone like this, uh, so this is R2, we have a cone like this. Uh, so this is sigma, the dual cone is something like this. Okay, is the cone generated by the yellow uh, outlines. Um, and then what one does is the following. We consider inside the dual cone only the rational points. We need more space. Only the rational uh, points. And we think of them, uh, they form a semi group. Uh, they generate a semigroup. And I take, uh, I think uh, they generate a semigroup. And I think uh, of uh, the element, uh, the element as generators of an algebra. So this is one uh, case uh, of the algebras we were considering. It's finitely generated as non impotence. So I can take X spectrum. And this is what is called uh, an affine toric variety. And it is the toric, affine toric, toric variety that we associate to the original cone. While I'm talking about this, uh, perhaps I will stop again. I will ask if there are questions. This is the appeal of toric geometry. Toric geometry in one slide, okay? How? Uh, so the, the, the fundamental object is a convex polyhedral cone, to be honest, strongly convex polyhedral cone. Uh, I, I'm assuming actually, uh, I should better assume that the generators, uh, I forgot one thing, it's also rational. is generated by elements in the, the generators are in, in, in the lattice. This is very important. Why I'm talking, I'm saying this because uh, when G is abelian, the quotient uh, uh, C and mod G are exactly like this. Are exactly like this. And uh, I think I have slides uh, showing them. So uh, we are considering the case of uh, uh, quotient C2 mod Zn, where Zn acts in this way. The, okay, the generator is uh, um, this matrix. Okay, this is the generator of the action. This is clearly, uh, this generates a Zn. Um, and the determinant is one of this matrix. So uh, this is inside SLN to Z. 
the two C. SLN2, yeah. Um, yeah. You mean SL2? Okay, yeah. SL2, yeah. SL2, mm -hmm. yes. Um, okay, here in the first line, you, you see A, A, L, E, and we'll come to this later. This is the name uh, of uh, the, re the resolution singularities uh, for some reasons, but uh, let's forget about it. And in uh, um, the fan, uh, uh, sorry, the cone, which here it's, uh, it's I wrote fan, a fan is a collection of cones. In this case, uh, the, we only have one two dimensional cone, uh, uh, which is infinite, okay? So here I just uh, uh, colored part of it in pink, uh, it should of course mean the infinite cone generated by these two uh, rational um, vectors, zero, one, and n, one minus n. Okay, this generates a, 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 a cone, and you should believe me, of course, in this moment, it's an act of faith, that if you apply this construction, you get the quotient C2 mod Zn. You apply this construction, I see it's a little uh, slow to, to follow me, the, the iPad, but anyway. Uh, perhaps it's the connection. Uh, if you apply this construction, um, you, uh, you get exactly uh, C2 mod Zn. Okay. Now note that if I, if I take the generators, I will write here, if I take the generators of the cone, I write them, these are two vectors, I write them in a, in a, in a matrix. The determinant of the matrix is N. <clears throat> And uh, okay, uh, this means uh, that these two factors are not a generator of Z plus Z. They don't generate the, the, the lattice. They miss some points. Uh, for instance, this point uh, one zero cannot be written as a com linear combination of them with integer coefficients. The result is that the variety is singular as it is, as we know as it is. And then the recipe to regularize it is the following. We take uh, the cone. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, 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 the gray cone is just a special case for n equal to, right? Where the determinant in, is two, so singular. The space is singular. And uh, on the, and, uh, the, the drawing on the, on the right uh, describes uh, the, the singularization. Because what you do is the following. You pick this cone and you split into two in such a way that the new cones are generated by vectors uh, which yield a determinant which is plus minus one. You see that for the yellow cone, the determinant is one. And for the green cone, the determinant is uh, minus one. Actually, the, the fact is that the matrices must be in the general group uh, with the integer entries. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, they are, because these matrices are invertible in the integers, having the determinant plus minus one. Minus one is okay, acceptable, okay? Mm -hmm. Met metric with integer coefficients uh, and determinant minus one as an inverse with integer coefficients as well. And therefore we get uh, a new variety, which is no longer a fine because it's not associated with one cone. It's associated with the two cones. And it is, uh, for this reason, is a variety, which is not a fine, it's covered by two affine varieties. So it has two charts, each being uh, an affine variety, okay? And um, 
Good. Uh, I think I will stop here. And tomorrow we shall go on exactly with this construction with more examples in two dimensions and uh, we shall uh, go to three dimensions and uh, we shall state uh, and discuss uh, the McKay correspondence in two and three dimensions. So for today, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hugo. Uh, let's join me to give a big applause to Hugo. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we, we have time for questions. So are there any uh, questions? Uh, Dima, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Hugo. So my question is about the, this uh, classification in case of C2 for simple yeah. algebras. You wrote this uh, equations for ideals, right? Polynomials for ideals. So, uh, so how do how can I derive? You know, if I don't know anything about the construction, how can I derive? Let's say this all these algebras just you know from polynomials. I'm not sure. My, so what is in, in other words? What is special about this particular polynomials here? Well, uh, which polynomials? So. This well, this equation, algebraic equation. That, that well, I know how to to, to get them, uh, and uh, it's uh, in particular using tonic geometry uh, because it's encoded in what I said here. Uh, you see, uh, you have to look for a set of generators of this semi group. Uh, as a um, in these cases, uh, uh, due to the fact that the group is inside the cell two, uh, you will have three generators. And therefore, as elements in Z2, they are, the, they are not independent. They are related by a relation. And the relation is the equation. So this is a piece of uh, authoric geometry, right? But uh, it's exa exactly what you do. So in this way, you get, uh, the, and now uh, behind it, uh, you have uh, the classification of the uh, finite subgroup of a set to C. In this way, you get, you get the list of possible singularities. I mean, this is, I would answer your question. So this is how you also see that there's a finite number of polynomials or relations. Yeah. Uh, polynomial, yeah. yeah, 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 up to uh, changes of, uh, of coordinates, the, uh, these are the only possible ones. Is it up to change of uh, uh, polynomial um, coordinates or you allow something more general, holomorphic or something like this? No, no, we are doing algebraic geometry. So you just put regular function? They are regular, they are polynomials. Okay. Not even regular function. I mean, yeah, polynomial. Regular functions on the whole. Uh, yes, fine. that's right. Okay. Yeah, and the change of coordinates uh, are uh, linear changes of coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, Sasha, you, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, <coughs> clarify my confusion. So first of all, thanks for the talk. It's very nice. I mean. Uh, so second of all, uh, I, I probably did not uh, understand the example because uh, if in the first example, when you constructed variety, you consider it exactly C2 over Z2, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and you said that it, it is variety, but then you gave an example C2 over Z2 with probably different action. I don't understand why it's not variety now. You say. It is a variety. I didn't say that. The action may be assumed to be the same. Huh? It is a variety. Yeah. Uh, well, but what is not then because you said that now it's made of two cones, it's not what no, I said the resolution of singularities. Ah, okay, is not in a fine variety, it's a variety, okay, okay. Which is not fine. it has two and fine patches. Uh, I will go into more details tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that, that is already about the resolution, but the resolution is covered by two varieties, right? I mean, by two and fine varieties, it's a variety. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but it will find uh, find the right. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this is no longer one cone, it's two cones, it's called the fan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the fan of the resolution of singularity, yes. Okay, right. now I understand, thanks. Yeah, they're never, the resolution of singularities are never defined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, any other question or remark? Uh, Armand, yes. Please go ahead. I don't think we can hear you. He's un unmuted, but still no sound. No, he's un unmuted now, but mm -hmm. there is no sound, uh, Armand. Uh, perhaps you should check uh, either your microphone or your settings on your computer. <laughs> so perhaps meanwhile we can... Oh, it's very low. It's really low. Yeah, it's really low. Perhaps you can write uh, the qu his question in the chat. Yeah, maybe if you cannot arrange the sound problem, maybe you can simply type, if it's a not too long question, you can type it in the chat. about Zariski topology. Oh, okay. Can you see the question, Hugo, in the chat? Ah, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to look at it. What is the chat? What? Oh. Well, the question is simply, uh, it's, a, it's about Zariski topology, and what is the reason to use it? Okay. It, it, it's, it's the natural topology when you deal with uh, 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 in, um, spaces that are defined by polynomials. Um, it's a very special geometry, which is uh, the right one, so to say, to use an algebraic geometry. It's much... Uh, um, uh, uh, coarser topology. In the case of, of uh, varieties over C, these varieties also have uh, the usual Euclidean topology that they inherit from CN, say, right? Because as a final variety, varieties, they sit inside CN. So they inherit also the classical, uh, sometimes called classical topology. And the fact, uh, uh, the topology which relates to the algebraic structure of algebraic geometry, the Zariski topology. The topology which relates to commutative algebra, for instance, is the Zariski topology, not the Euclidean topology. It, and it, Armand, Armand is uh, also adding, even if it's not Ausdorf, that's yeah, okay. It's not Ausdorf. It's not Ausdorf, and actually the notion of being Ausdorf is uh, uh, replaced by uh, the notion of being separated, uh, which mimics uh, the property of being out of. It takes uh, what is a property of being, uh, so uh, uh, in, in classical topology, uh, space is out of, and only if the diagonal in the Cartesian product of the space by itself is closed, if and only if. And then you mimic this uh, saying that uh, you define what is called the diagonal embedding and you ask it to be a closed embedding and you say that when it happens, the, 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 sp the, the space is separated. So you do such things. But you also you have a, a theorem which says that when the variety is over C, uh, 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 it is a separate and there's a risky topology if and only if it is Hausdorff in the, in, in the classical topology. So there are relations with the usual topology, but uh, yeah, it's not outdoor, but you replace uh, this. Uh, if you want to, I mean, in algebraic geometry, you can also consider schemes uh, 
uh, not varieties, something a little more general that are called the schemes that are not separated. But otherwise, you can use this notion of being separated as a replacement for being out there. Okay. Yeah, you added the line, okay, because of algebra, yes, exactly, because of that. 